So we're at a transition point. We have to decide uh, which way we go from now uh, up till now. Uh, energy has been mainly produced by fossil fuels. Uh, it's leading to pollution, it's leading to climate change. We have a choice about whether to continue along this path or to transition to producing energy from clean and renewable sources. And this has become increasingly urgent. The International Energy Agency has said in May this year that the world has a viable pathway to building a global energy sector with net zero emissions in 2050, but it is narrow and requires an unprecedented transformation of how energy is produced, transported and used globally. And this is a dramatic turnaround actually for the International Energy Agency. Previously, they have uh, significantly underestimated the contribution uh, that solar could make, that they have uh, not emphasized the need for an energy transition. So this is a, a traditionally a quite conservative uh, energy agency. And what they're saying now has to happen is that from today, there should be no investment in new fossil fuel supply projects. By 2035, there should be no sales of new internal combustion engine passenger cars. And by 2040, the global electricity sector should have already reached net zero emissions. So those are the things that we need in order to get to net zero emissions in 2050 uh, from the global energy sector. So today I'll talk about the bright future of renewable energy. I'll talk about where we are now. I'll talk about what technologies we have available, what's coming in the future, and what can you personally do uh, in order to facilitate this transition? Just to give some background, it's helpful to understand the numbers that we're talking about here. Uh, and so to understand the difference between the, the different numbers, because a lot of um, numbers get thrown around. Uh, and what we're talking about here is numbers in the terawatts, and that's not something that people are normally familiar with. So let's just uh, explore that a little bit. So watts are units of power. That's how much energy you're producing in a, in a given amount of time. Um, so if you're thinking of something that's one watt, um, that would be about enough to power a laptop, something like that. If you multiply that by a thousand, then you have a kilowatt. So that's about enough to power a toaster. If you multiply that by a thousand again, then you're talking about a megawatt, about the amount of power that a small plane might use. You multiply by that, by that a by a thousand again, and then you're talking about gigawatts. And this is about the amount of power uh, that a coal power station would produce. You multiply that by a thousand again, and then we're talking about terawatts. And this, these are numbers on the scale of the world's energy use. So keep that in mind, just understanding the difference between um, those power units. So most of our uh, electricity at the moment is produced using electromagnetism. It's produced essentially by spinning turbines. So uh, what happens is that you burn uh, a fuel, fossil fuel, you produce some steam, that steam turns a turbine and then that turbine produces electricity. So that's generally how we're producing electricity at the moment. And what we're using to, to power that is often coal. Um, coal, of course, we have a large supply of coal. We have um, hundreds of years worth of coal uh, in, in the ground still. Uh, it produces a lot of carbon dioxide uh, when we burn it um, to, and produce steam, turn the turbine and produce electricity. Another way of producing electricity is to use gas as a fuel. Um, we also have lots of gas. Um, particularly uh, in Australia, but in, in many other countries as well. It does produce less carbon dioxide than coal, but it still produces a lot of carbon dioxide uh, when you burn it um, to produce electricity. The other options that we have are, of course, wind. Wind is a clean, renewable energy. Um, it's suitable in many different locations across the world, and we've seen a significant increase in the amount of wind power that's being produced uh, everywhere around the world. And then we have solar energy, which is my area of research. Uh, so when I'm talking about solar energy, I'm talking normally about solar photovoltaics is what you're probably familiar with uh, seeing on people's roofs. But of course, uh, solar can be used 
in other ways. One way is to have a passive solar house. Uh, so having the light coming in through windows and warming your house that way. And in fact, my house is passive solar and it makes a big difference uh, in a cold place like Canberra. And the other thing that you can do is have solar hot water where you're directly um, heating the, uh, the water from the sun. So it's helpful to get a sense of uh, what renewable resources that we have available. So if we want to uh, stabilize the climate, we need terawatts of emission-free power. So this we've seen before um, that energy on the scale of powering the planet is around terawatts of power. So we have to look at what we've got available in terms of renewable energy resources. And if you look at how much uh, hydroelectricity is available, you've got something like half a terawatt. If you look at, at power from all the tides and the ocean currents, you would have a couple of terawatts. If you looked at geothermal over all of our land area, you'd be looking at something like 12 terawatts. Wind power could provide um, two to four terawatts, so significant, um, but still not uh, on the scale of uh, the whole planet's power. But if you look at how much solar energy is available, we have 600 terawatts. And this is the reason that solar energy in particular is really crucial for our global energy transition. Just to uh, give you more of a picture of just how much uh, solar energy resource that we have, um, here's a picture of Australia. We have a, a lot of sun in Australia, of course. Uh, and the little red dot there shows you the area of Australia that we would need to cover if we wanted to supply all of Australia's electricity. Uh, and the green dot shows you the area that we would need to cover if we were somewhat more ambitious and wanted to supply the entire world's electricity. Now, of course, we're not going to do that. Um, and anyway, if, uh, if you did provide a large fraction of the world's electricity, uh, it would also be distributed across Australia, not in one big dot. Uh, but the point is you can see that it only takes a small area uh, of land to produce all the energy that we need from solar power. And of course, many other countries have good solar resources as well. So what's been happening in recent decades is that we've seen a dramatic reduction in the cost of solar. Uh, you can see here in this graph that in the 1970s, the price of a solar pa panel per watt, the power, cost around $100 per watt, right? Uh, when we get to today, it's something like less than 50 cents per watt now. So this is a dramatic reduction of a factor of 200 in the price of solar energy over recent decades. And the result of that is that solar has grown exponentially. So we've seen a dramatic increase as the cost has, has decreased. As a result of all this, we've now got more solar going in than any other technology. So there's more new capacity being installed of photovoltaics than any other new capacity. The exciting thing also is that in second place is wind. So we have actually already happening a revolution in the type of energy that is being installed each year. Uh, the fossil fuels are then coming second. And to give you an idea of just how dramatically this has changed, when I was earlier in my career, uh, we were excited because photovoltaics had just passed nuclear at that point. So there's been a dr dramatic uh, transition in just how much photovoltaics uh, has been installed. Uh, uh, wind is also being installed at a very high rate. So the reason for this now, as I've mentioned, is that dramatic a reduction in the cost of renewable energies. And this shows you um, more uh, as a comparison to fossil fuels, just the, how low the costs are now. So you can see that uh, the variable renewables, wind and solar are now cheaper uh, than anything else to install. They're cheaper than fossil fuels. Uh, of course, fossil fuels are now starting to attract the risk premium because uh, People are seeing how things are changing in terms of, of um, carbon dioxide restrictions. And so there's an investment risk associated with fossil fuels. 
Even when you add some storage into the system, the renewables are still cheaper than the fossil fuels. And of course, this is why they're now being installed at a higher rate than any other technology. Uh, the cost is coming down now. We can see that the costs uh, are actually down to around $20 per megawatt hour, which is equivalent to two cents per kilowatt hour in, in some countries. So uh, those, those costs have really come down very dramatically over recent years. And it helps to understand in a bit more detail exactly why this happens. So this graph here is a learning curve. Uh, so what it shows you is the price in dollars per watt um, as a function of the cumulative module shipments in megawatts. So what's happening here, and you'll notice that both of these, um, this graph is a log scale on both. So it's increasing by a factor of 10 um, each time you go up a, a tick on the, on the axes. Um, so this is a log log scale graph. And this is a very good way of, um, uh, of showing exponential data. So what you can see is that every time we double the um, cumulative PV module shipments, then we reduce the cost of the photovoltaics. And in this case, we reduce it by around 23%. So that this is what people mean by economies of scale. As you keep producing, you keep lowering the cost. And this happens uh, because we're producing at large volumes uh, and also because of technology developments. And because of this, you can predict that the cost of, of photovoltaics is going to actually keep decreasing because we see it continuing to come down that cost curve. What we can also see is we're actually on track to be producing terawatts of um, photovoltaics or, or solar energy. And so that we're starting to be on track to produce solar at a scale that's significant enough to have an impact on climate. So this graph here shows you the annual um, installations in gigawatts per year. Now remember, gigawatts is around the, the size of a coal power station, right? That was around one gigawatt. So we're producing, um, we're installing solar now at a scale of around 100 gigawatts per year globally. Uh, and what you can see also on this graph is that solar has been growing uh, at a rate of around 38% per year for decades, actually. So that's an astonishing growth rate. If you think most industries would have a growth rate of, of something like 5%, perhaps. Uh, solar has been growing at around 40% per year. And you can see that uh, if this continues, within a few years, we will be installing at a rate of a terawatt per year. And that's certainly enough to ha have a significant impact on climate. And this has implications that are beyond um, what we traditionally use electricity for. Uh, so, so, for example, ele electric cars are cheaper to run than petrol cars. They can now be cheaper using renewable electricity. In addition, reverse cycle air conditioning is cheaper than gas, and it can now be cheaper with renewable electricity. So this means there's a lot of scope for emissions reductions through disruption of the oil and gas industries. So the things that we've traditionally used oil for, for example, um, transport in, in cars, the things that we've traditionally used gas for, for example, heating, uh, they're likely to be electrified instead, and that, um, Electricity can come from renewable energy. Okay, so I've talked now, I've talked up to now about where are we now. Uh, so I'll talk now about what technologies that we have available. So get into, into a little bit more into the technical details. So firstly, I've talked a lot about solar. I'm gonna, just gonna tell you a little bit uh, about a sol how a solar cell works because I know a lot of you uh, want to know with that sort of technical interest in, in how things work. So what happens uh, with a solar cell is that you have light shining on the solar cell uh, and inside the solar cell, you have a junction between two different types of silicon usually. Uh, and that creates uh, essentially a, a barrier that allows electrons to flow in only one direction. So the sunlight comes in, it excites the electrons, allows the electrons to move, 
the electric electrons can only move in one direction. And so they move actually round the circuit uh, and produce electricity that way. So here's another way of looking at how a solar cell works. This time we're looking at uh, as a function of energy. So as you go up the page, uh, that's increasing energy. So what happens uh, is that the light comes in, it excites the electron, gives it more energy, and the electrons can essentially then go down the hill um, to and um, the, the space where the electron is uh, moving in the other direction uh, that allows current to flow in the solar cell and gives you some voltage. So that's how the, the solar cell works. Uh, solar cells can um, be installed in all kinds of different types of systems. This shows you some pictures of some residential systems on people's houses. Uh, you can have small systems of around a kilowatt or so. Increasingly, people are putting on big systems of around five kilowatts just because um, it's, it's so cheap now. Uh, and with these systems, you can easily offset all the electricity used for an efficient house. The good thing about solar is that you can install it uh, on a much larger scale as well. Uh, so this is the Royala Solar Farm near Canberra. It's 20 megawatts. Um, and that has 83,000 solar panels, which is enough to power about 10,000 homes. Uh, and this one is one of the largest solar farms in Australia. So uh, we said previously the, the one at Royala was uh, around 20 megawatts. This, this, these ones are around 50 and 100 megawatts. So remembering um, that um, megawatts, uh, you know, what you might uh, use to power a small plane, something like that. Um, so the Ningen farm is five times larger than Royala and it produces enough electricity for about 50,000 homes. Uh, the other technologies that we can use, of, of course, are, are wind and wind is uh, also a very major um, contributor to renewable energy production. This one, uh, this picture here shows you the MacArthur Wind Farm in Victoria, um, 420 megawatts. So that's around half a gigawatt. So remembering um, that gigawatts is around the sort of scale of a coal um, power station. Uh, these things are very big, um, 112 meter rotor diameter. So 112 meters across um, the, the diameter of those, those blades. And each of these, um, each of these wind turbines is around three megawatts. Capacity factor is around 35%, means it's, on average it's operating 35% of the time. And this solar farm, this wind farm costs around a billion dollars. So you can see this is very big business. And now when we're putting these sorts of uh, systems into the grid, when we're putting solar and, and wind into the grid, we do need to think a little bit about storage. We do need to think, okay, those systems are operating some of the time and not all of the time. Um, so as we move to 100% renewables, which we certainly are going to have to, we have to start to think about storage. Uh, and if we wanna think about storage, we have to differentiate between power and energy, right? And this picture um, shows you a very nice distinction between power and energy. So uh, on the left, you have somebody pouring from a cup. You see you've got, you've got a lot of water being poured over a short amount of time, but there's actually not very much capacity in that, in that cup. Um, so it, it won't last for very long. In contrast, somebody's pouring uh, from that big container there. They're pouring at a pretty slow rate. Um, but it's a big container, it can store a lot. Uh, and so that's what you mean by energy storage. So this is the difference between short-term power storage and longer-term energy storage. All right, so with that in mind, we can compare the different types of energy storage technologies. Uh, and this shows you a kind of comparison of lots of different types of energy storage technologies, lots of different types of batteries, um, compressed air storage, pumped hydro storage, capacitors, flywheels. Uh, and what you can see is that they're, they're good for different applications, essentially. Um, some of them have a higher cost per unit power. Some of them have a lower cost per unit power. Some of them have a higher cost per unit energy and some have a lower cost per unit energy. 
So that means um, things like batteries are, are pretty good for, for power type applications, um, but things like pumped hydro are, are better for if you need a, a larger amount of energy storage. Uh, what are we storing at the moment? Well, we're storing um, almost exclusively pumped hydro. So, and that means pumping water um, uphill and, and storing energy that way. Uh, so it's important to keep that uh, in mind around 99% um, of the total storage capacity on the grid at the moment is pumped hydro. It's only a very small amount that's been stored actually in, um, in batteries. So what is pumped hydro actually? So pumped hydro is when you pump some water uphill. Um, so essentially from a lake that's, um, that's at a lower level, you pump it up to, to another lake that's at a higher level. Uh, and that's when you have some excess electricity. So when you want to actually get some electricity from your system, you allow the water from the higher lake to actually flow through the tunnel and it can flow um, through the turbine then uh, and make the turbine spin and then produce electricity. So essentially you can move water up and down. Um, you can allow it to go through the turbine and produce electricity. And so that uh, allows you to get hours of energy storage at a pretty cheap price. Now, this is an example of um, a pumped hydro system uh, at Tumut uh, in, in Australia, not very far from Canberra, just a few hours drive um, from Canberra in the, in the snowy mountains. And you can see that you can just pump water up and down between um, the, the two systems. All right, so let's move on then to, uh, to batteries, as that's another, of course, very topical storage system uh, at the moment. And batteries um, have the advantage that they can be used for lots of different applications. And actually, the, the fact that they're, you can use them for a lot of different applications has been an important factor in um, the cost reductions in batteries over recent years. So for example, um, when people first started using mobile phones, of course, they wanted to have a better battery and that creates that demand for improved battery life. Similarly, with laptops, people want to have a better battery. They're willing to pay for it. That creates the demand for better batteries. And because, as I was talking about before, when you have those economies of scale, it's really going to reduce the cost um, of those batteries. And similarly, now we're starting to see uh, electric cars. People also want better batteries for their electric cars. That improves the performance. And overall, we've seen the same thing with solar actually um, over recent decades. If you have some kind of small thing that you're producing at large scale, and if you always have an application for it, then you can reduce the cost really significantly. Uh, and solar saw that you know, decades ago, people used to install solar on remote um, telegraph poles, things like that. Um, people installed solar in off-grid houses. And then they started to install them in residential houses and finally in solar farms. So all through that process, there was that demand for, for solar, for cheaper solar. And as a result, the price was able to come down. Similarly, we've seen the um, price of batteries um, dropping dramatically. And so we can expect to, that to continue because of those wide applications. Uh, and we're starting to see batteries installed now in many places around the, the world, supporting the grid, especially for short-term applications. So for storage of around uh, a couple of hours. So as I mentioned before, this is a power application uh, rather than energy storage. It's just for sort of producing that power over a relatively short amount of time. But as the costs decrease, we can start, we'll expect to see um, that storage over larger amounts of time. Uh, this is the proposed Victorian big battery in, for Australia. Uh, it has a, a power capacity of 300 megawatts and a storage amount of energy storage of 450 megawatt hours. Uh, one of the big advantages of batteries is that they can respond really fast to disturbances. So they're actually better than, than gas power plants for doing that. And as a result, they're able to make money um, by, um, by 
um, selling that that power when there's a, a shortage of power for a short amount of time on the on the grid, and that can help with short term storage and also with transmission constraints if you don't have um, enough power transfer in a particular uh, location, the battery can help with that. So, so far I've talked a lot um, about power and about electricity in terms of reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and that's because power is um, the major source of uh, emissions. Uh, if you look at um, overall emissions from, from energy, but it's not the only source of emissions. And so we really need to consider uh, what we're doing about the other sources of emissions. So this um, is a pie chart that shows you the energy related emissions by, by sector. You can see that power is 38%. That's a really big one. And that's the cheapest option for decarbonisation. So solar and wind are great options for decarbonising power. But we do have other big parts of um, the energy sector that we also need to decarbonize. Um, as we've seen with passenger cars, that's very likely to be electric vehicles. Uh, we've also seen that with, with space heating uh, and water heating, uh, actually heat pumps are a good option. And then again, they can be powered by electricity. But we do have some sectors uh, of the economy that are really not uh, that don't have good decarbonisation options at the moment. Uh, and you can see there uh, things like iron and steel, cement, um, chemical industry, um, freight, so heavy transport. Those at the moment don't have good decarbonisation options. And so we need to um, think about um, what other options we could have. So for that reason, people have been recently uh, talking about hydrogen uh, as an energy carrier. So it's important to recognize that hydrogen is not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. So in that sense, it's like electricity, it can move energy around, uh, but you have to produce it from somewhere, okay? Uh, and there's a couple of major ways of doing that through electrochemical means, or through thermochemical means. And once you've got your hydrogen, you can use it for a range of different things. So you can use it for, for heat, um, for example, you can use it um, to produce electricity again, which you then use for something else. Um, and you can use it also for chemical reactions and, and feedstock for making chemicals. So mostly hydrogen uh, at the moment is produced from fossil fuels. Um, in the steam methane reforming reaction. So it's mostly produced from, from gas, um, can also be produced by other fossil fuels, but it's almost entirely produced by, by fossil fuels at the moment. What you can do instead uh, to make zero carbon or renewable hydrogen is you can use electricity from wind or from solar, and you can put that electricity into an electrolyzer um, so basically applies, applies a voltage um, uh, with, to some, some catalysts in an electrolyte and that splits water to generate hydrogen. So in that way you can make uh, zero carbon renewable hydrogen. Uh, so in order to do that though, you do need very cheap electricity. Uh, so this graph shows you the, um, the price of hydrogen. It's a, it's a contour plot. So the color tells you about the price of hydrogen. And it's as a function of the energy conversion efficiency and the electricity cost. So the energy conversion efficiency we're talking about here is the electrolyzer, um, usually something like 50 to 70% efficient, pretty efficient. But what you see is that the um, price of hydrogen that you produce is very sensitively dependent on the electricity cost. So it's really important to reduce the cost of uh, renewable electricity in order to make renewable hydrogen. So if you could decrease the cost of solar further, that means producing fuels and chemicals from electricity could become viable. Once you um, can produce uh, hydrogen from, um, from wind and solar. You can also um, mix it together with, with carbon dioxide and a carbon dioxide electrolyzer and potentially also produce other materials as well. So if you um, could produce hydrogen that way, then you'd have hydrogen available for, for transport. Um, so you could make fuels for transport 
Um, you could make heat um, for high temperature heat for industry, uh, for producing steel and cement. Uh, you could also produce, use it as a feedstock, um, especially for example, for producing steel, you actually need to, um, to reduce the iron ore. So you need to remove the oxygen from the iron ore. And for that you normally use coal, but you could also use hydrogen. It's important to recognize though that direct, using hydrogen directly is often not the best thing to do. Um, sometimes it can be more efficient to actually um, use electricity rather than to, to um, produce hydrogen. So this is one of the nifty things um, about heat pumps. Heat pumps are, are quite amazing. They can actually have efficiencies of over 100%. Uh, and that's because they're moving heat rather than generating heat. So if you produce um, electricity from renewable sources um, and then use, um, use a heat pump, you can get efficiencies of heating your house of over 100%. Uh, in contrast, if you used renewable electricity to produce hydrogen uh, and then uh, burnt that um, to heat your house, the efficiency would be much lower. So it's important to think about you know, which way we should be doing things. And this, of course, is one of the reasons that you need to do the, um, the engineering calculations to see um, which way makes more sense. So if we we're gonna use hydrogen, um, definitely there's some interesting applications for hydrogen, um, but especially um, for producing high temperature heat. And that, in that case, it would displace gas. Uh, we don't have a good option at the moment for producing high temperature heat. So um, burning hydrogen could be useful for that. And the other case that it could be particularly useful is as a feedstock. So replacing coal um, for producing steel, for example, uh, and also um, for as an input to making some, some new kinds of um, fuels and things, things like powering aeroplanes. Basically, we're always going to need some, some fuels to do that. It's just too hard to power them using electricity. And so we need new sources for making those fuels rather than using um, fossil fuels. Uh, and this is just uh, an example of, of why you shouldn't produce hydrogen from fossil fuels. And I say this because uh, the chief scientist, the previous chief, chief scientist of Australia had, um, had suggested it would be a good idea to produce um, hydrogen from fossil fuels, but it really isn't. Uh, so this is an example of for exports from Australia, supposing we were going to export um, 12 million tonnes of hydrogen, um, what would that require? It would require 88 million tonnes of coal or 37 million tonnes of natural gas. Um, even if we, we captured some of those emissions with carbon capture and storage, which would be expensive, um, we would significantly increase the carbon dioxide emissions um, from, from Australia by doing that um, by um, 8% if we'd made the hydrogen from steam methane reforming and 18% if we'd made the hydrogen from coal gasification. So when we're thinking of doing new things, we have to make sure that we're doing it in um, a low carbon way. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to make things worse. That's, that's certainly very clear. All right, so I've talked now about where we are and what technologies we have uh, available. I might just go to the, um, the, the Q&A. We've had, a, we had a few questions here, so I'll just take a little break to answer some of these questions. Um, so we, ha we have here a question about what's the efficiency factor of pumped hydro and how does that compare with batteries? Um, so with pumped hydro, you get about um, uh, you get about um, eighty percent of the um, the round trip efficiency. So when you pump the um, the hydro up um, around the the round trip efficiency is around 80%. So that's pretty high. So you get 80% um, of the energy that you put in essentially. Battery, batteries are around 95%, so that, that is um, higher. So the, I guess the point is that they're both pretty high and then overall it comes down to the cost. And at the moment, pumped hydro is significantly lower in cost for, um, for energy applications. So for long uh, periods of storage like 
10 hours, 24 hours, um, pumped hydro is, is significantly cheaper at the moment, um, but for short-term um, batteries are um, a better option. So that brings me to the, um, the, que the question below then, which one is better pumped storage or batteries? And the answer um, is very much, it depends on your application. So um, for these short-term storage batteries at the moment, are, are better, definitely. They have the advantage that they can respond really fast. Um, and so they can help stabilize the grid over very short um, timeframes, um, but they're still expensive for large amount of storage. storage. So for, at the moment, um, for more than a few hours, um, pump storage is the cheaper option. Um, yeah, and that the follow up there was as a as a consideration of loss energy and profit. That's right. So so um, people are now um, installing um, batteries, especially because uh, the demand is is for that short term storage. Um, what you'll find is that um, so at the moment there isn't so much demand for the longer term storage. Um, that will tend to happen as we get more more renewables into the grid. So as we get more renewables into the grid, we will need the longer term storage. And then um, there's, there's two possibilities. One is that the cost of batteries has come down enough by then that batteries are the better option. The other option is that, that pumped storage will be the better option. Okay, so I've just answered a few questions there and I'll move on to now what's coming in the future, especially um, some of the research that we're doing to improve um, solar cells. So to understand what's required to improve solar cells, we have to understand where the cost's coming from. So I said previously that if we can keep bringing down the cost of solar, we open up a range of applications. Um, so for example, especially in, in making hydrogen that we can use then for high temperature heat applications and also for fuel applications. So how could we then um, bring down the cost of solar further. Well, the important thing to know is that your solar module, so the thing that you can hold in your hands, is only about 25% of the whole system costs. So if you take your solar module, hold it in your hands, if you then put those solar modules up on your roof, um, wire them all up, install them, all of that process is actually three quarters of the cost. Your module itself is only 25% of the cost. The rest is what we call the balance of systems. Uh, so that means the inverter, the mounting system, cables, labor, interest rate, all of those sorts of things. And it's very difficult actually to uh, reduce the cost of those balance of systems costs. They're based on mature technologies. Okay, so we have to think, okay, well, what can we do to reduce the cost then? Uh, the answer is that we can build higher efficiency systems. So if we have a higher efficiency systems, we essentially need less panels for the same power, okay? And that means we have less installation of labor, less mounting hardware. Overall, we have less balance of systems costs. So that's how we can reduce the cost of solar is to increase the efficiency. And you see this very much in the trends in solar technology. So this shows you um, trends and, and predicted trends uh, for different solar technologies. And you see there, there's a big change in the types of technology that's being installed. In particular, you can see um, this, this orange one is increasing early, um, dramatically. That was a solar technology that was invented in Australia, actually, uh, in the 1980s. Um, that's very much now um, taking, taking over and it's being installed as the, the major solar technology. But you also see, um, predicted there are other new technologies coming in, and these are higher and higher efficiency technologies. So the trend with solar is that trend towards higher and higher efficiency. Uh, but there's a limit to how far you can go with your standard silicon um, technology. I showed you that, that picture before of the, the energy levels um, in the silicon, and because of that, those energy levels, there's actually a limit into how efficient you can go. So um, if you, it's because the voltage that you produce with a certain energy level is always gonna be about the same. 
um, the, the result of that is that when light hits a silicon cell, the red light is used very efficiently, but the blue light, as you may know, blue photons have more energy, um, but that extra energy from the photons is, is just lost um, as heat. So what you can do instead is to make uh, what's called a tandem solar cell. Then you have two solar cells stacked on top of each other. One of them has a lower energy gap and one of them has a higher energy gap. And when the light comes in, the blue high energy photons get absorbed by that top cell and that gives it a higher voltage. And then the red photons go through the top cell uh, and they're absorbed by the silicon cell and they're used efficiently by the silicon cell. And overall, that can give you a higher efficiency. So that's what we've been working on in our research recently. And we're using some new materials called perovskites. Um, perovskite actually refers to a crystal structure. You can see uh, there in the picture, that's the, uh, a diagram of the crystal structure where the little, uh, the little balls there are atoms. Uh, and that's the crystal structure of the material that we're using. Uh, it was originally found in the 1800s um, as calcium titanate, but you can replace those elements with different elements and it's still called a perovskite. They were named after uh, Perovsky, who was a Russian mineral mineralogist. Okay, so these are the um, perovskite materials that we're, we're using. Uh, the nice thing about them is that they're really easy and cheap um, to make. So you can, you can actually just um, coat them almost like a paint um, onto your solar cell and you can still get higher efficiencies with them. They also have that high energy gap, which is really nice for, for making those tandem solar cells that I talked about where you absorb the blue photons really efficiently. Uh, so this shows you um, some of our work with, um, with world's highest efficiency solar cells. What we did is we made this perovskite uh, solar cell and put it on top of a silicon solar cell. Um, we, through that process, we got an efficiency of over 27% for this um, combined um, perovskite and silicon um, solar cells. The cool thing is you can also actually connect these up um, to produce hydrogen. So the other thing that we've done is to take these perovskite and silicon cells and combine them with a catalyst and um, the sunlight then um, produces enough energy to power those solar cells and to produce hydrogen directly. So we have a way to connect the solar cell to actually um, then produce, um, produce hydrogen. All right, so that's some, some of the um, exciting research that's coming in the future. Um, I'll just finish up now by answering the question, what can I do for all of um, people who are interested in, in contributing in, in some way? Um, what can I do? I'm, I'm going to answer this firstly very directly, okay? There's actually a lot that you can do as an individual, um, whatever your, your career path is. There's a lot that you can do as an individual. And just to, uh, as an example of this, I show you the um, household greenhouse gas emissions in Canberra. So this is a typical household. We'll be producing around 14 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year um, just from the, the operation of their household. So that means appliances, cooking, lighting, hot water, um, gas heating. Uh, and if you, um, if you um, have an efficient house, you can dramatically reduce that. So this shows you that an efficient house and cheaply achievable, you can get that down to around five tonnes per carbon dioxide by using efficient appliances, using solar hot water, um, insulating your house. And there's similar sorts of things you can do um, you know, regardless of your situation. So um, my first message is that there's a lot of scope for individual action to make a difference. Secondly, um, there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, I've said before, we need um, a global energy transition. This is, the this is the message from the International Energy a Agency. We need to completely transform the world's energy systems. Uh, it's certainly doable. It's, it's very clear that it's achievable, but it's not straightforward. And there's a lot of things that still need solving. It will occur over the next 50 years. It has to occur over the next 50 years. It will require new skills, 
new thinking, new technology and innovation. And so we need highly skilled engineers and scientists to make this future happen. So there's lots of opportunities here is my message. Um, it requires creativity, it requires innovation in very many different areas, energy systems, power engineering, technology development, uh, a whole range of things. So above all, it's a very good time to be embarking on a career in STEM. If you're interested in study um, at ANU, we have um, a couple of very good options. There's a, a Bachelor of Engineering with a major in Renewable Energy, uh, and as well as a Master's of en Engineering in Renewable Energy. So the links there um, will give you um, the details of the, um, the study plans there and, and how to apply. So to summarize, uh, solar is expanding really rapidly um, at a rate, it's been growing at a rate of around 40% per annum. We're getting to the point where um, we're building enough solar to uh, actually start transforming the world's energy supply. Uh, there's a lot of scope um, for using electricity in, in other sectors that will start with, with cars um, and also with, with heating of houses and buildings, but it won't stop there. Um, there's a lot of scope also to be producing other fuels um, such as hydrogen uh, from electricity. Uh, all of this means we'll need to integrate uh, solar at, at high levels into a much expanded grid and we'll need the storage um, that I've talked about and also there are an increasing uh, developments to keep reducing um, the cost of, of solar um, through, through new technologies, um, such as I've, I've talked about with the work that we're doing in research here at ANU. So um, in summary, overall, uh, a global energy revolution is needed. Uh, it's already started actually. Uh, solar and wind are growing rapidly. They're being installed at the highest rates of any technologies overall. Um, so we've got good options for storage um, in pumped hydro and, and batteries. And renewable hydrogen is also promising for those hard to electrify applications, which, which uh, definitely need addressing. We actually have to do all of these things now to get to net zero emissions. If we, if we want to get to net zero by 2050, uh, we need to move on all of these fronts and we need to move very rapidly. So overall, that makes it a great time to be starting a career in energy. Um, and I'll now answer um, some more of the questions and uh, I'd really encourage you to um, ask any other questions that you have. I'm, I'm very happy to answer them. Okay, uh, there's a question here that says, does solar PV only produce uh, energy when there's solar heat? Uh, where is the energy stored? Can it be applied in countries with low sunlight? Okay, so uh, yes, this solar PV is only producing energy um, when the sun is shining, okay? Uh, it's not stored by the solar panel itself. Um, it can be stored in, in batteries. Uh, and it can be stored, as I've mentioned, um, by pumping water using the electricity it produced to pump water uphill. Uh, and so those are the two ways that you can, um, you can use it for storage. Can it be applied in countries with, with low sunlight? Um, yeah, actually pretty well um, in, uh, in most countries. So for example, um, Germany also has a lot of um, solar, even though, um, uh, they don't have um, as much sunlight compared to Australia. So um, overall, um, solar can be applied in, in very many countries around the world. You do get more energy um, and it's, it's cheaper in countries where you have a lot of sunlight, but it can be applied um, generally in, in most countries. Okay, um, and another question here about um, how, what's the percentage of energy that's used in insight incident sunlight in a typical solar cell. Okay, so you're asking about what's the, what's the efficiency of, of typical solar cells. So if you look uh, at a solar cell that's on your roof at, at the moment, it would probably have an efficiency of something like 18% or so. Um, so with the tandem cells, it's possible to increase the efficiency um, really quite significantly compared to your, your standard solar cells. Okay. Uh, there's a question here now about dye sensitized solar cells. How do they compare to other types of solar cells? 
and what role will diasensitized solar cells play? Okay, so diasensitized solar cells, um, they, they use uh, uh, a dye to absorb the sunlight and then um, the, the energy gets transferred from the dye um, to, um, to the electrodes of the solar cell. So they have uh, relatively low efficiencies, around 10% or so. So, um, so diasensitized solar cells are a type of photovoltaic solar cells. Um, a lot of the research on diasensitized solar cells has now moved into the perovskite solar cells. So the perovskite solar cells um, seem like a much more promising approach and, and most of the people researching in them have, have moved into the um, perovskite solar cells. So I would say my feeling is that they won't play a role in the future, but that research and learnings, um, some of that has been transferred into the research on perovskite solar cells. Um, and the question here is what's the highest efficiency we've achieved with tandem cells? Um, so in our group, we've achieved efficiencies of, um, of over 27%, as I've mentioned, um, with, with tandem so solar cells. So that's with a, a combination of the perovskite and, and silicon. Uh, question here is, is the field of electrical engineering dying out since renewable energy is growing so rapidly? And um, so I would say, you know, renewable energy is, is kind of like a, a part of electrical engineering. So the, with renewable energy, you're looking at the production of the, the uh, electricity. With electrical engineering, uh, you're looking at how it all fits within the system. So, um, so that looking at how it all fits in the system is important. Um, however, you produce your electricity, um, there's going to be need to be new ways of, of looking at it um, now that we're producing uh, renewable energy uh, much more than fossil fuels. So definitely, I would say it's, it's not dying out. Um, it's an important area uh, and there's still a lot to figure out um, about how we will transition the, the grid to a renewable energy system. Uh, there's a question here about um, what are the common types of solar cell used in Australia? So... Um, overall, the, the types of solar cells uh, used uh, are similar throughout the world. It doesn't really matter where you are. Um, they're all they're, they're um, almost all silicon solar cells uh, at the moment. Um, the as I mentioned, the efficiency has been increasing for the for the silicon solar cells, but that needs to um, will need to increase further, and then we'll need to think about what other technologies there are. Um, but at the moment, the the, um, the types of solar cell are, are similar everywhere, and I would expect that would to be continued. Okay, um, there's a question here um, about people wanting to, uh, governments wanting to charge people to register their solar uh, PV installations or stop them feeding back into the grid and issues with the integration and that um, power companies are losing out on revenue. So yeah, this is a important issue um, and does need to be addressed. Uh, and it needs to be addressed in, in a sensible way over the long term. Um, overall, um, one, of, one of the issues is that the, is that the kind of uh, revenue structure that's set up for the power companies isn't, um, isn't sort of the right way of doing things. The other thing is that um, as, we, as we add more renewables into the grid, we will naturally sort of lead to this type of curtailment, right? We will naturally have times when we're not um, using the produced electricity. Um, this will be less of an issue as the, as the costs decreases. Um, but what you don't want to do is, is change the rules. So what you want to do is to have some kind of um, clear rule structure where people know what their return is going to be and it doesn't keep changing. Similarly, we've had the same sorts of problems with solar farms that, that um, after solar farms have been installed, they've been changing the rules. Uh, and so this means that people can't make an educated decision if the rules change later on. Um, and, and that affects the, the return on their investment. So overall, what we need is um, an approach to this that's, that's forward-looking and that is clear to people 
um, and so that they can make a good return on the investment, whatever the rules happen to be. And um, another question then, what are the current thoughts and approaches to dealing with these attitudes, both in Australia uh, and abroad? Um, yeah, so um, we need to think about um, what you can do about the, the issues of, of curtailment as we, um, as we increase the amount of renewables in the system. The main thing that we need to do overall is to, um, is to make sure that the system um, provides enough support. I mean, as the cost of batteries comes down, this will also be less of an issue because um, people will be, it'll be cheaper to install uh, batteries on, on solar home systems. So that would be less of an issue uh, for curtailment um, at, the, at the local level. Um, for the solar farms, the main thing that we need to do is to increase transmission and that will um, uh, allow these um, sorts of uh, reductions in, in capacity, reductions in output um, to be not so much of an issue anymore. But it needs to be dealt with in a coordinated way is the, is the main point. Um, and similar to the previous question, does this also mean that the field of mechanical engineering um, is, is growing? So um, what we, we need, I guess, um, installation of, um, uh, of renewable energy systems. There is uh, mechanical engineering in, in um, some aspects of that, um, particularly I would say uh, in, in wind farms in, in pumped hydro. Um, uh, I guess overall that though that um, mechanical engineering is uh, affected by a lot of other things, not only what's happening in, in renewable energy. So I wouldn't be able to say overall whether that means mechanical engineering is, is growing. Okay, so that seems to be all the open questions. I hope I've, um, hope I've answered those. Okay, um, very nice to, to talk to you all. Um, yeah, and I guess um, you can um, contact people at ANU if you, if you have further, further questions.